Hello again, everybody. This is Craig Evans of Autism Hangout, and thank you for tuning into this episode of Ask Dr. Tony, where Dr. Tony Atwood answers your questions about autism and Asperger's. Hello, Dr. Tony. It's good to see you without a mask. Uh, here I am, here, the, the, the real Tony, no uh, mask or hidden uh, characteristics, yes. It's just nice to see you. Uh, it's been, it's, COVID is, has been tough on all of us. All right. Well, we have queued up many questions over COVID. And if you're ready, I'm ready. Yep, I'm ready. Let's go. First category, self-esteem, self-identity. I am in my mid-50s and I've just been diagnosed with ASD. My diagnosis came about from struggles in my professional life. Now, you have spoken about being a first-class Aspie. Can you talk about how to balance the deficits of ASD that create issues with others and the strengths that can come from it? After years of coping and not that successfully, what does a first-class Aspie look like? Mm, good, very good question. I think it, it's creating a lifestyle that matches your abilities. The difficulty in employment is that sometimes you are very good at something, maybe the information, the knowledge, the problem solving. And then the organization you work for may put you into team leadership or aspects that you find very difficult to cope with. They're not really tapping into your strengths. What I would look for is an ability to explain yourself to other people. It's to remain the authentic self in many ways. But it's going through, I'm the sort of person who likes routine and consistency, etc., and to the other members of the workforce to say, I'm the sort of person who's not so good at meeting in the pub on a Friday afternoon. I prefer to go home and, and play chess or something like that. So it's the confidence to explain who you are. Now, it means if you had a diagnosis in mid-50s, then there were a lot of compensatory mechanisms that existed over five decades. And we've got to look at which ones are successful. Um, but it is very important to focus on the qualities of autism and learning how to adapt and explain yourself in the neurotypical world. Um, a first class Aspie also is somebody who may, in your maturity, pass on to other Aspies your wisdom of what you found successful, for example, in employment and helping other people. You can do this on social media and things like that. So you have experiences that may be of benefit to other people, and it would be nice to return to the younger generation aspects of your wisdom. So a first-class Aspie, I think, is content with who they are does not seek radical change and be an artificial self and appreciate the qualities rather than the weaknesses in interpersonal life. Very good. This is also in the same category. So how ought an autistic treat themselves in thinking about themselves? Any ideas that might stick and cause a better internal life? Mm. I've been involved in some research uh, which focuses on maturity, uh, aging, uh, in other words, my age and older. And one of the things that came through for those 65 and above was to be less critical of yourself. One of the characteristics of autism is self-criticism. Now, when I analyze the criticism, it, it's far greater than any parent has done, any teacher, any boss, line manager or friend has done. It's what the autistic person themselves expect of their own performance. And it's, as we say in England, to cut yourself some slack, to be kind to yourself. And that's what I would ask you to do is to be kinder to yourself and actually look at how amazing your abilities are. It's not what you're final achievements may be, it's how far you've traveled for those achievements. And other people may not be aware of the amount of effort that went into it. Only you know that. But please be kind to yourself in acknowledging that. It's also, I think, to have closure and forgive those that may have rejected and persecuted you. Otherwise, there's a tendency to ruminate over why would you do that? And you can't 
dis- should we say, <laughs> have closure on what's occurring. So please forgive those who have been mean to you, rejected to you, and so on, and also their ignorance and malicious uh, components. But it's also potentially meeting other people on the spectrum and joining with them as a new culture and a new engagement. It's a new life there. So how ought an autistic treat themselves in thinking about themselves kindly? And interestingly, some of the kindest people I know have autism, but please be kind to yourself. Very good. Next question. I read a lot where people with Asperger's have high IQs, yet are unable to find work or happiness, especially in relationships. Why is that? And how many individuals with Asperger's who have an IQ of 160 work a job that fulfills them and is in a successful relationship? Has Dr. Tony actually met? That's a good question. It is, and it, 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 it's very poignant in a variety of ways. Um, one of the risks in autism is underachievement. Uh, that is, your knowledge, your qualifications are exceptional, but you may not be in a job that allows you to do that. You are a very kind, loyal, honest person, but you can't find or maintain relationships at a level that you would really like to do. A lot of this is to do with interpersonal skills in the job situation, for example, and the employment accommodating autistic features. This is intriguing because with my friend and colleague, Dr. Michelle Garnett, we've written a book about to be published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers in a couple of months' time called Autism Working. And this is a workbook which goes through the challenges socially, sensorily, executive functioning skills, ability to explain yourself, etc. And it goes through a list of questionnaires, uh, exploration of your abilities and recommendations. So I would suggest to have a look at autism working because it also includes how to explain yourself to your work colleagues and your line manager. There are also videos you can download as well. Um, so that your line manager can watch the video about autism and understand you to a greater degree. So I would suggest that also Jessica Kingsley Publishers have a a lot of books on employment. Um, Now, relationships. The issue here is meeting each other's needs. Sometimes the need in autism is going to be at home for solitude. But the neurotypical partner's need is for companionship. Um, Now, the qualities of autism are honesty, trustworthiness, often handsome, uh, maybe source of income. um, But it's also the emotional and social needs of the partner. Now, what I've found, because I do work in, in relationship counseling in autism, is that when the autistic person is motivated, they will achieve it. They will, they will get there. All, all they need is guidance. Again, Jessica Kingsley Publishers have a number of books to help relationships. A new one by Maxine Aston, the uh, Partners Workbook, second edition, is a very good resource for the two of you to go through to understand each other's perspective. So it's really a question of guidance and support for the relationship to be successful. And once you have that motivation from both partners to learn, it's a problem of of dual empathy in the sense that we say that there is a difficulty in autism of understanding the thoughts, feelings of a neurotypical. But there's also the neurotypical's difficulty in working out the thoughts and feelings of the autistic person. I can't read your facial expressions. Your mind seems to be a blank to me and so on. So it's working out better means of communication, but crucially to meet each other's needs. Otherwise, the autistic person feels a failure because they're not meeting their partner's needs. Mm -hmm. So we fortunately now have resources to help. Mm -hmm. Dr. Atwood, you travel the, the world in giving speaking engagements. And I'm sure during these conventions, oftentimes a first class Aspie will approach you when you meet somebody that you would consider a first-class Aspie, 
do they show these characteristics like an extraordinarily high IQ and satisfaction in their jobs and satisfaction in their relationships? I have met Asperger's autistic people who are happy. Yeah. But it's a different definition of happiness. Uh, for neurotypicals, their happiness is their social network and the intimacy that may occur mm -hmm. uh, verbally, uh, emotionally, and, and physically. In, in autism, your sense of happiness may be time in nature, time with your pets, the achievements. You Seeking knowledge, often um, with autism, there's a thirst, an almost an irresistible, unquenchable thirst for knowledge and the information, mm -hmm. and it is getting those, those needs there. So when we look, is, are they successful? It may not be in neurotypical terms. It may be in autistic terms. Mm -hmm. Very good. Next is about multitasking. Hi, Dr. Tony. I have a problem that nobody seems to understand. I can function seemingly okay in a job as long as that's all I do. I can be social and maintain friendships and family relations as long as that's all I do. And I can keep my home in decent state. I can maintain hygiene, etc., as long as that's all I do. But I cannot do them all at the same time. They're all very demanding tasks that completely drain me of mental energy. And trying to handle them all makes me burn out over and over again. I feel like I can't deal with the everyday demands of life at all, as there are way too many. What am I to do? Okay, often people don't realize the amount of energy consumption that an autistic person consumes in work, social, daily living skills, etc. It's phenomenal. And Maya Tode, who's based in Copenhagen, she has autism. And she's actually now qualified as a clinical psychologist and, and sees her clients in Copenhagen. And she's brilliant. She's really good. And she developed the concept of energy accounting, like a bank account. What you will do with that is in your day, there are going to be energy withdrawals, socializing, budgeting, crowds, certain people, uh, expectations and so on. They will drain you of energy. Social is very important in that sense, but also anxiety drains you of energy. But then there are things that infuse you with energy, maybe solitude or special interest, being with pets or in nature, etc. But it means as though the means here that the balance is needing adjustment. And so what we would do in this situation is find out what is it that drains you of energy. We make a list of them and then ask you for each one, zero to 100. 100 means a lot. Um, what's the range? And, oh, that, that's 60 to 90 or that one's 40 to 80, etc. Um, and then in a week, what have you actually consumed your energy on in categories of interpersonal? Um, it may be work, uh, it may be uh, budgeting and so on. And then look at what have been the infusions of energy for you, zero to 100, I'd say. And if it's in balance, you risk burnout, but depression as well. And energy depletion is a major cause of uh, depression in autism. So it means that you then need to be very strict with yourself. And in the following day or the following week, you must, if you can, reduce those things that drain you of energy and increase those things that infuse you with energy. And you have to do that. Otherwise, if you're trying to be successful on all fronts, you've discovered you can't. It takes too much. So you've got to do some pruning. And sometimes it may be part-time employment may be appropriate. Um, it may be in terms of contact in friendships and family relations, etc. You may need to say to them, I, I need a break. I need a bit of solitude here. It, and you need to say to them, it's not rejection. I'm not rejecting you. It's not that the friendship or the, the family uh, relationship has ended. It's just I need time alone to recover. So you need to explain those components because there's a fear of rejection and so on. And it may also be that you need a life coach, somebody who can talk to you about what are your priorities, what are the essentials, you've got to keep those going. What are the ones, well, it's a bit debatable. If you've got the energy, do it, but only do it if you've got the energy. So you need to look at re-energizing strategies. 
The next category is meltdowns. And because of COVID, we had a much higher percentage than usual of questions related to meltdowns. And these are meltdowns in adults. It's just trying to cope. Please do a show on meltdowns in adults, in families, in workplaces, marriages, and relationships. How can this person help themselves? It's one of the most difficult parts of autism in the sense of a meltdown. And the person wants to avoid them. But sometimes they, they happen and then there's remorse for what has occurred. It's going to affect the attitude of other people towards the autistic person. And because meltdowns are very unusual in the neurotypical, often they don't understand what's going on here. Now, when we explore meltdowns, it's usually due to social and sensory overload. There's just too much going on. And it's like a fuse blowing. I can't um, cope with the situation anymore. Um, what we're going to do is, is have a whole session in the future specifically on meltdown. But I'm just going to go through a few components. One is looking for the signs and situations associated with a meltdown. Now, due to problems of what we call interception and alexithymia, sometimes the autistic person is not very good at introspection. That is identifying their own emotional and stress state. And they're not picking up these particular uh, characteristics. And so what that means is that this explosion occurs out the blue. They didn't see it coming. It's been building up for time, but it's almost like a mind-body division. The heart rate, the perspiration, all the signature characteristics physiologically of meltdown, also of thinking too, may not be recognized, but they may be recognized by other people. So part of the approach is looking up at what are my internal signs, what are the situations, and share that with other people because family members, uh, partners, and so on may know a lot more about this is something that is a significant trigger for you. And what we look for in a meltdown, meltdowns are divided into those that are external. That is, it's an explosion, physical, kick a hole in the wall, smash something, and it is an outward expression of the degree of agitation. It's external. But it can also be internal and self-harm and a depression attack. And that's of great concern, obviously, because accidents can occur. But it can also be shut down, uh, selective muted. I just can't talk. I can't do anything. I am frozen in uncertainty. And sometimes PDA, pathological demand avoidance, is a little bit like that in the sense, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't put my shoes on. But I know I need to put my shoes on and everyone's else. But I just somehow can't do it. It's, it's a shutdown. I can't do various things. So we need a plan, uh, both for yourself and for others. So when you see the signs of this is likely to be on the way, and sometimes you can use the new sports swatches that measure heart rate, etc., or circumstances that indicate, right, I'm going to need to take a break. Um, I need to find some where I can go to recover. Um, but also what other people can do that doesn't make it worse. For example, uh, often when I talk to the person, I say, what would you like your family member to do? Don't interrogate me. Don't ask me what's the problem. Don't. I can't. I can't tell you. I don't want to tell you. No, it's not a good idea. Uh, it's to stay calm because if you're uh, irritated, annoyed, or fearful of where's this going to end up, um, then that's going to make the person worse because they're very sensitive to your own emotional state. Um, often for the autistic person is you need time out in solitude to recover. It takes time. Or sometimes a special interest as a thought blocker. Really, it's, it's solitude and gradually mm -hmm. to recover and then be OK. Prevention is better than cure. But this is such an important topic that we will return to it for a future episode. Very good. Focusing on self-care again. The next question, what is autism versus mental illness? Dear Dr. Tony, I'm a self-diagnosed female and I'm having a hard time differentiating between psychological and neurological. For example, what is the difference between autism and a mental health illness, like ASD and schizophrenia, or ASD and bipolar, 
or ASD and narcissism, or ASD and BPD. How can you tell the difference? For instance, if someone is autistic, are they also narcissistic and manipulative? For me, it's hard to differentiate if someone is actually being cruel or simply unaware of their actions. Mm. Very good point. Uh, Christopher Gilberg, um, who's based in Sweden, has the concept of autism, that is autism pure, and autism plus. And autism plus is plus attention deficit disorder, plus anxiety, plus depression, plus dyslexia, plus borderline personality disorder, and so on. And 85% of autistic individuals have another condition that may be viewed as a mental health illness. Now, unfortunately, autism is defined and the diagnostic criteria are in a document by the American Psychiatric Association, uh, DSM-5, and it's referred to as the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And this is a historical component of autism was originally viewed as childhood schizophrenia or childhood psychosis and is a, an expression of schizophrenia. We know it's not. The level of uh, autism and schizophrenia is the same in the general population, um, 2%. So 2% of autistic people develop schizophrenia and it's 2% in the general population. So there's not a higher level really. Um, when you have autism pure, the prognosis is much better because a lot of that is predominantly learning social. A lot of the diagnostic criteria in section B of DSM-5 are actually due to anxiety and their strategies of coping with anxiety, routines and rituals. Sensory sensitivity and anxiety go together. When you're anxious, you're more sensory sensitive, more sensory sensitive, the more anxious you go. So that they combine and play off each other. Uh, and the special interest is sometimes used as a thought blocker or emotion management and so on. So when you have autism pure, the prognosis is pretty good. But the stress and strain, and we don't know why, but the association with anxiety and depression and so on, can be of greater concern than the autism itself. So when I'm dealing with adults and I ask, what are the priorities here? Often it's not the autism. It's my anxiety. It's, it, it's my depression. That's what really is something that I need help on. Now, that means that the treatment for anxiety and depression needs to be adapted to accommodate the alexithymia of autism, the difficulty explaining your thoughts and feelings in, in speech, etc. Um, but it's also how does someone adapt to autism? And sometimes that's by camouflaging the characteristics. Sometimes it's by narcissism is more of, I don't get social, I don't get emotional. It's obviously not important because I'm not good at it. And so they deny the value of social and emotional aspects and pride themselves on their intellect and objectivity, etc. It's a form of compensation and comfort that I will value what I'm good at and I will dismiss what I'm not good at. Borderline personality disorder, if you look at the characteristics of BPD in DSM-5, as an expert in autism, I go, yep, 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 I know a lot of people with autism who have those sorts of characteristics, which means that if you're looking at some of the adaptations, the close engagement to certain people, the extreme distress if that friendship is broken, the intensity is too much or sometimes too little. So um, when it comes to mental illness, yes, it's there. But my concern is that mental illness services may not know about autism. I see autism as it's going to be a disorder. It's a developmental disorder, not a mental health disorder itself. But it means that if you go into a psychiatric hospital ooh, or an eating disorders unit and things like that, they're not autism friendly. The staff may not be trained in autism and the noises and the group work and the expectation to engage. And you don't necessarily have a room of your own. Um, mental health services need to understand autism when they have someone with a mental illness. They need to screen for autism. 
right at the beginning when they start involvement with a psychologist or psychiatrist to be aware of those characteristics, but then adapt the therapy to be autism friendly. So autism is associated with mental illness, but it's often a consequence of being autistic rather than a central component. This is another autism plus question. Autism and ADD or ADHD. Dr. Atwood, can you speak how a dual diagnosis of autism and ADHD can manifest in a person? Mm. We, there is research in this area. And again, this is autism plus. And about 75% of autistic individuals have signs of attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And sometimes that's picked up before the autism is identified. Now, attention deficit disorder evolves over time. We have the hyperactive, impulsive um, elementary school child. But in the teenage years, it evolves into what we call impaired executive functioning. What is executive functioning? Like a chief executive of a big company, organizes, plans, prioritizes, time manages, etc. And in autism, that's difficult. It may be a real problem. Now, when we look at what is ADHD that may be associated with autism, is an area we look at of attention control. And it's either way. It's either they can't attend and they keep being distracted by everything else, or it's over attention to one activity and not realizing the content. <laughs> Mm -hmm. context and actually uh, we need to move on here oh i've got to have closure i've got to finish it and so on so it's attention control and regulation could be a problem it's also inhibiting impulsive i know it, i know that, that's what i'm going to do well well hold on a moment there's also a plan b this is the flexible thinking well yeah that might work but before you do that just think are there any alternatives that may be more efficient or a better way of doing this so it's uh, being impulsive, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, we also find in autism, it's a problem with working memory, especially auditory memory. And auditory memory is often weak. And as my dear mother would say, when you give an instruction, it's in one ear and out the other. <laughs> and often uh, for the kids, what, what did the teacher set for homework? Uh, I've forgotten. But they, they only, only told you half, uh, I've forgotten. Or they get to the top of the stairs and they shout down to mum in the kitchen, Mum, what am I going to do? I've forgotten. I just told you what to do. I've forgotten. So it's verbal memory. It's that cognitive flexibility, uh, that one track mind. Sometimes that track is the most efficient way of dealing with the problem, but sometimes it's the wrong track. And the autistic person may be the last to know they're on the wrong track and not do what neurotypicals will do is um, – Look at other kids. What are they doing? OK, that's a source for me. I'll ask the teacher and so on. That degree of flexibility uh, exists and they don't hit the panic button, don't have a meltdown. And for a typical person, until they've exhausted about half a dozen different attempts and different strategies. In autism, the rigidity means there's only this way. And if it won't work, I can't cope with it because I haven't got an alternative there. It's also... Um, Organizing and, and, and planning, what equipment are you going to need? And organizing it means that as an adult, yeah. your house is full of incomplete chores that are not being done. And you, you had energy to begin with, and then, well, uh, it's still not painted. It's still not working, etc. So a lot of unfinished jobs. It's organizing what you're going to need. It's planning. It's also uh, starting procrastination and completing things as well, as I say, but also time perception, working out how long is it going to take to do this? Mm -hmm. and, and that time perception can be a bit of a problem. Now, fortunately, um, this occurs in autism, but it's not exclusive to autism. There's a lot of research in helping individuals in this area that range from various strategies, the executive functioning, right, mum's the executive secretary, plans organizes with your homework you'll need to do 20 minutes on this five minute break 20 minutes on this activity this is marked in red this is the first priority if you've done it and you've got time you can go on to the next one mm -hmm. 
So often when they are at high school, they are more reliant on a parent getting their act together, proofreading, checking, all those sorts of things than you would think considering the person's intellect. So attention deficit disorder, ADHD, yes, it is there and it's accessing information in that area. The next question is about empathetic attunement. Dear Dr. Tony, Aspies are said to have difficulties reading people's emotions. Could you please go into some detail as to why that is not a contradiction to empathetic attunement? <laughs> yes. Ah! One of the problems is then that the person with autism who's not reading nonverbal communication is, is assumed not to care, but it's really a question that they didn't read the signals, especially subtle, subtle signals, that this person wants a hug, this person needs affection. And if they don't read the signals, then they don't respond as anticipated, and then you're accused for not caring. Um, it's strange. When you use neurotypical strategies to work out what someone is thinking and feeling, neurotypicals tend to do it in an auditory and visual sense. The visual sense is reading facial expressions, body language. The auditory is tone of voice. Cognitively, it's the context, etc. And neurotypicals have an ability to use those channels very effectively. But I strongly suspect there are other channels that have developed through evolution. And this is almost a sixth sense, a subconscious feeling. And if you look at it for survival, sometimes you're going to need a sixth sense of whether you are in danger. This is that sort of, uh, I'm just out of here because I just it just doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. What is it? I just don't know. And that is a skill that helps you survive. So I think in this sensory profile, as much as you can get extraordinary auditory and visual sensitivity and so on, you can get extraordinary emotional sensitivity, even from a distance. Mm -hmm. And the trouble is that the person can be, the autistic person, easily infected by other people's negative emotions. We talk about the infection rate of COVID. Yeah, to be physically ill, but often for an autistic person, they can be infected by the negative mood of other people. So I talk to an adult and they'll say, and I'll say, how are you today? Oh, I'm, I'm not so good. I'm feeling down. Oh, what's happened to make you feel? Well, actually, actually, nothing. Ah, oh, I had a conversation with Rebecca. Rebecca's feeling down. I've been infected by Rebecca's downness, mm -hmm. etc. So it's a subconscious sensitivity. Often the person with autism can't put into words exactly how they do it, but it's usually incredibly accurate. So trust that component. Now, we get it from autobiographies of that ability to perceive others and being infected and conversations with clients. It's not really uh, a research area yet, and it needs to be. Now, when I'm working with those who have this characteristic, I go through the advantages and disadvantages of the empathic attunement, being able to pick that up. Now, the disadvantages are it's a risk of being infected by negative mood. So sometimes social withdrawal is not because of sensory and social um, sensitivity and being overwhelmed. It's a protection mechanism of withdrawing to be away from others that will contaminate me. Another is wanting everybody to be happy. And so some teenage girls um, who have this sixth sense and these autistic teenagers will desperately want their friends to be happy. And they'll spend all lunchtime appeasing their friends to make them happy again. It's got nothing to do with what the autistic girl has done to them. And it may be two girls who have just fallen out. But no, I've got to make them happy again. And it's, it's that desperate need to make people happy. Um, it's also uh, avoiding some social situations because of the vulnerability. And it can lead to a successful career in the caring professions. Um, a nurse, teacher, psychologist, psychiatrist. But when I work with such individuals, one of the problems is they're so sensitive to emotional state in others, more than a conventional psychologist. They, they are picking up dimensions that a typical psychologist wouldn't do because they use conventional strategies. But I have to help them uh, not be infected by the experiences of their clients. Mm -hmm. 
and, and, and to create a shield and, and not to feel down because you've got extreme empathy for their situation, which is good. As a clinician, you need that. But the downside of it is it will drain you. So you need an umbrella for the rain of emotion coming down or a shield or a suit of armor or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it is an advantage in terms of, of, of career, but uh, you must be able to protect yourself. So it's it's one of the strange things of autism. It's in many ways I'm fascinated by the contradictions, the conventional testing of working out what someone is thinking and feeling using NT channels, not so good. But autistic channels, oh yeah. Very powerful. Dr. Tony, we have many questions that came in over COVID, but we have one more question that we could ask today, and then we'll pick up a series again in the future. This is about faking it and masking. Hello, Dr. Tony. I'm currently a student teacher, and I'm struggling with coursework and with my course instructors who told me that I cannot be a teacher. Unfortunately, my symptoms increase a lot due to the emotional stress I'm facing. In school, I manage to hide my Asperger's quite well. But now as a teacher, I don't. What can I do to function better? Also, would you advise against a career in teaching? No, not at all. And unfortunately, your course instructors are demonstrating their ignorance. Now, uh, I obviously give presentations all over the world with uh, different members of the audience. And some of them are predominantly for teachers. And I'll talk about autism to help them support autistic kids in their class. But I invariably get teachers coming up at the end of the session saying, Tony, Tony, um, you just described my life. I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but but I'm on the spectrum. This expect yeah. And and this is true. And some of the most talented teachers are on the spectrum. Actually, they're usually very good at teaching autistic kids because they make the classroom an autism friendly environment. Mm -hmm. And they have a teaching style that's not contemporary. It's not, should we say, what uh, teacher training colleges <laughs> expect because they're teaching their teachers to entertain, to engage, that you're on stage and you, you've got to get them entranced by your personality and so on. And that's not easy for an autistic person to do, but it's not the only way to teach somebody. And when you've got structure and purpose and so on, and I have found that autistic teachers can be very good. Their difficulty can be in managing kids who are, how shall I put it, wanting to upset the situation and, and so on. But it's a skill you can learn. And it doesn't mean to say you can't be a teacher. You look to the training college to give you advice in that. Now, when I talk to those teachers, they say, my problem is not the classroom. It's the staff room. It's the bitchiness, it's the meanness, it's the in-group and out-group, or the expectations I'm supposed to socialise with them. But when I'm in class, this is a female teacher, I'm queen of my domain. It's just me and the kids. And the kids respond to that structure, that uh, sense of order and consistency, and they respond uh, accordingly. So please, uh, having autism should not be a reason to abandon teaching. Um, please go ahead, uh, do it. But you may need help in behavior management of kids that are a challenge within the classroom. Mm -hmm. But as a teacher, you are likely to have an ability to convey your information in a very successful way. Depends on the topic. At high school, um, there are many who are chemistry teachers, math teachers, science teachers, but also music teachers. And there's no uh, type of teacher that I would say mm, an autistic person can't do. I would say it's all of them. But the person may need a mentor, fellow teacher, mm -hmm. who can help them with the protocols, the egos, the policies, all the ins and outs where the person is a whole new ball game. Mm -hmm. And usually their problem is other teachers, mm -hmm. not the kids. Mm -hmm. I'm pleased to hear you say that because one of the extraordinary gifts of autism is the ability to think and think well 
And to be able to put these people in higher institutions, they can reach NTs because, frankly, they're that much smarter. So it pleases me to hear you just enforce or reinforce how important it is that people on the spectrum consider teaching as a career. Oh, yeah. Dr. Tony, that's all we have time for today. I always look forward to these sessions because they're so educational. So thank you again for today. And uh, I hope to see you again within another couple of months. And we'll, we'll dig back into this pile that COVID gave us. Okay. Before we go, Craig, I, I, a little <laughs> comment for me to make. Uh, it's July. Um, and we're recording this. And for me, this is a very significant month because in July 1971, I went as a volunteer to a special school and met two classically autistic kids and decided in July 71 to do have a career in autism. That was my goal. That was my ambition to be an expert in autism. And I've become an expert in autism by actually coming in and ask Dr. Tony and what you're doing. Thank you so much, Craig is so affirming of my conviction when I was 19 yeah. to have a career in autism. And what I've learned is now passed on to other people. And it's great that this is passed on and so on. But I'm, I'm celebrating my 50th anniversary <laughs> of exploring autism. Mm. Oh, my gosh. I'm so grateful you're a part of this community, Dr. T. I'm so grateful. 50 years, half a century. But think of all mm -hmm. the lives that have been able to listen to what your research has given us. So I thank you for the whole community. Thank you, Craig. I really appreciate that. that it, what I would like is a time machine to go back to my 19-year-old self and say, <laughs> yes, you'll do it. You will be successful. You will exceed expectations. Very good. And thank you, everybody, for turning in. We'll be back again soon with another Ask Dr. Tony. <laughs>